how is everybody today? Good. Happy Monday. I'm going to have to do that the old fashioned way today. All right. Anybody have any questions on the homework? Any, but good morning. Any questions on your homework? Get two chapters to read. Chapters eight and nine. Eight was on nutrition. It's a little bit complex, especially with all the diets. You do need to have a basic understanding because CNAs are responsible for feeding patients and providing snacks and things like that. So you do need to understand um, some of the different diets and how we can help the patient choose snacks or meals that are accommodating those diets. So you might have a question on the state exam, like um, your patient is on a low sodium diet, what would be an appropriate snack? Then they would list four options. Um, you know, something like sugar-free jello, pretzels, uh, peanuts, or um, processed cheese, you know, and, and most of those things are high in sodium, sugar-free jello would not be. So you would want to choose the appropriate uh, snack there. So you do have to have a little bit of an understanding of nutrition, nothing really in depth. Um, those of you who go on for nursing, you're going to have an entire semester of nutrition. I mean, in nursing, we get down to the molecular level of food. So it's way more complex than what you're responsible for knowing. So I want to, um, before I get your grades, I want to talk to you guys about something that uh, kind of that I experienced this weekend. So I was, um, I, I got a message from somebody who was, they were taking some online practice tests and some of the questions that were on these practice tests, they were completely, um, made them very insecure about the test. So for instance, they sent me the link and I looked at some of the practice questions. And one of the questions that really stuck out to me was um, uh, if a patient is infected with some uh, pathogen, right? They have some sort of a, a an infection. What is the period of time called between the onset of infection and the uh, onset of symptoms? And it had four choices, and um, the ch something like prenatal. Uh, prenatal pre-eminent, uh, prodromal, and proactive. And this really kind of threw the, the student because, oh my gosh, we didn't cover anything about this in class. How, you know, how in the world am I supposed to answer this question? The answer for your own knowledge is prodromal, but that has no bearing on anything because that is not a CNA question at all. Not even remotely. So you need to understand that some of the, the practice tests that you're gonna see online were not written by people who understand what the scope of a CNA is. Good morning. Um, 
so when you're taking these tests, and I know most of you will go online and find some practice tests because you're nervous about the tests, and this is why I want to bring this up. When you're taking practice tests, be very, very careful about how much it al you allow it to degrade your confidence because those are not CNA questions. Those are questions that were taken out of a nursing textbook somewhere and put into an online format. And you guys do understand that you don't have to prove knowledge to do anything on the internet, right? Like there's nobody checking facts out there. I could call myself a doctor if I wanted to on my website. And nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's checking up on that. There, there's no way that I would have to prove I have that credential to use it in an online environment. So don't trust everything that you see online. Be really careful about that. And the reason that I bring this up is this individual, it really, really affected them. I mean, they were in tears thinking that they were not ready for the test. So I, I just hate for things like that to affect your self-confidence, especially right before you go to test. So be really careful about that, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and get your scores for chapters eight and nine. Stephanie? Uh, for eight, I missed one, nine, and one. Thank you. Micaiah? For the first one, I missed two, second one, I missed yeah. What? Yes. Two. Thank you. Valentina. Four times a hundred and nine. I missed two. Thank you. Do you have seven for me as well? Yes. I got a hundred. Thank you. Nerlene. Chapter eight. Um, number number four. I just missed it. Okay, so you missed one on chapter eight. Okay, and I'm going to go back and explain number four for you. And chapter nine, how many did you miss? Eight. You missed eight? Okay. And chapter seven. Okay. And I'm going to come back to that question in just a second. Alexa? Oh, I missed two for chapter eight, and I missed one for one. Thank you. Can I get seven for you from you? This might answer your question. LBC is a British phone-in and talk radio station owned and operated by Global and based in its headquarters in London. It was the UK's first license. How am I okay with that? Stop. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, Alexa, can you tell me and seven. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to number four on chapter eight tests. So number four asks, a decrease in necessary fluid in the body is called. And the answer here is dehydration. So we have to be really, really careful as CNAs to watch our patients for dehydration. It's very, very common. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one, we live in Florida. Everybody is dehydrated. <laughs> it's just the, the, the fact of being here, right? Everybody is dehydrated. But as we age, things change, right? Remember we talked about our skin changes. It gets drier and thinner and more prone to tearing. We lose um, the fat layer beneath our skin, which is protective and retains heat, right? Um, our metabolism slows down. Uh, our muscle strength decreases. There's a lot of changes that go along with aging. Well, one of the other changes that goes along is a decrease in the thirst drive, the thirst reflex. So now when I get thirsty, I know I'm thirsty and I'm thirsty now because I'm talking about it, right? So when I get thirsty, I recognize the fact that I'm thirsty and I go get a drink and that helps, right? 
Okay. There's two problems with that. Well, depending on what you're drinking, if you're drinking Mountain Dew for saying you're outside. It really isn't going to. It's not going to quench your thirst. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> um, yeah. So three problems with that. Let me let me. <laughs> so yes, it does depend on what you're drinking. And if you look at the nutritional label, you actually see that there's sodium in there, and sodium can further dehydrate you. So, um, so yes, what we drink is definitely going to play into that. But I want to talk specifically the elderly for a second, because the elderly have two problems. Number one, they that mechanism that tells them they're thirsty doesn't always work as they get older. That thirst reflex diminishes. So they're not getting those prompts, hey, you're thirsty, you need to take a drink. That puts them at risk for dehydration. Make sense? The second problem, especially in elderly that are receiving care, so either in-home care or care in a facility or something like that, is that when I got thirsty, I walked up, I don't have my mic on. When I got thirsty, I walked over there, picked up a cup, and took a drink out of it, right? Well, if I am in a facility, I may not have the ability to go find my own drink, right? They don't have access to the nutrition room. So when they get thirsty, they have to rely on somebody else to go get them what they need. Now they see you running around like chickens with your head cut off. You've got way too much to do and not enough time to do it. So they may be less likely to hit the call light and ask for something to drink. So these two factors, the fact that they, um, their thirst reflex is diminished and they don't have easy access to fluids leads them to be at higher risk for dehydration. Does that make sense? There's also another reason that's more nursing related, you know, uh, the, at the cellular level, things are not working as effectively. So that um, has to do with the fluid shift from intracellular to extracellular. So, you know, there, there's a mechanism there, which further leads the patient to be at risk for dehydration. So what we have to understand as CNAs is that our elderly patients particularly are going to be at risk for dehydration. So we need to know what dehydration is. And it means that I have to have a certain level of fluid in my body. And if I don't have enough fluid, things don't work right. And that, that process is called dehydration. Does that make sense? Does that help, Nerlene? Does that help? Okay. So do you guys remember me talking about um, pathogens? And I said they, they don't have legs. They don't have wings, right? They can't crawl, walk, fly. Not, they have to have fluid to move. You guys remember that? Well, everything in your body is the same way, all the nutrients. So your electrolytes, your proteins, your sugars, your... All the things that make us run has to have fluid to move. In fact, your bloodstream is made up primarily of fluid. We call it plasma because it's fluid with all those things in it, right? But if we don't have enough plasma, um, things can go really bad because now we don't have the fluid for those uh, nutrients to be transported. So dehydration really is kind of a big deal. So we have to watch for that. Good questions? And it's so easy to get dehydrated. Oh my goodness. It is incredibly easy. All right, let's go to page 57. So the first skill, we're only gonna learn three skills today. Two of them are variations of skills we've already learned. Not much to learn here. The last one is a little bit new. Um, I got a lot to go over with you for the last one, but the first two, pretty easy information that we're going to reuse from previous skills. 
And that's where we're going to start here. You will have about two to two and a half hours of practice time today. Lots of practice time built in. So our first skill for today is to perform passive range of motion to a hip, knee, and ankle. How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. So this care plan says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's right hip, knee, and ankle. Well, can we do the left too while we're there? Because we follow the, the whole and nothing but the care plan, right? So one of the checkpoints here is going to, to ask the evaluator, did you only exercise the extremity or the joint indicated in the care plan? And did you only do the exercises indicated in the care plan? So this one specifically, one of the checkpoints is, did you follow the care plan? <laughs> so um, we have to, to be very aware of that. So the exercise that we're asked to do here is flexion extension. And if you remember the, the range of motion we've learned so far, that's an up down motion. Flexion extension is an up down motion. Now we're doing the hip, knee and ankle, up down. And we're going to do the hip and the knee together. It's kind of a two for one exercise. So we're going to do it together. And the way we do that is when the patient is laying down, we're going to lift the leg up and bend at the knee. So it's like they're climbing stairs. Okay, so we're gonna bend the knee up to the chest and all the way back down to the bed. And if you look here, you'll actually see that the hip is bending as well as the knee. So both of these joints are getting exercised at the same time. So it's kind of a two for one exercise. What we don't want to do is a straight leg raise. You don't wanna do the hip independent. So here, um, Let me show you what I mean. And again, we're going to talk about changes of aging. Okay. All right, so now you can see the mannequin. So if I was going to exercise this mannequin and I needed to do a uh, range of motion on the hip, knee, and ankle, what I don't want to do is lift the patient's leg straight up like this. I know, broken foot. Straight up like this. Now, the reason that we don't want to do that is because of the sciatic nerve. Do you remember when we were finding the artery here? You guys remember that? And I told you that if the arm was straight and popped out, that artery was kind of popped to the surface and we could feel it better. But if the arm was sagged, that artery kind of fell down and, and was looser, harder to feel because it was deeper. You guys remember that? Same thing here. We have a nerve that runs from our lower back down the back of each one of our legs. This is called the sciatic nerve. And it actually goes all the way to the foot the sciatic nerve. Yeah, you will actually a little bit further because that, that's what's going to feed the, all the nerves to your foot or even your toes. And you know your toes are there when you stub them, <laughs> right? So this one big nerve from the lower back runs all the way down the back of our leg to our foot. Now, when we straight leg raise, what that does is it pulls that uh, nerve tight. There's no slack. Now, in young people, this doesn't really hurt a whole lot because everything is still pretty bendy. As we get older, we get less bendy. So when we try to raise that leg up and the muscles aren't going to give a whole lot, that's gonna put a lot of pressure on that nerve and it can cause low back pain, not only when we do the exercise, but it aggravates that nerve. So that pain can um, persist for hours or days. 
So we don't ever want to do a straight leg raise unless our care plan specifically tells us to do that. Now, if we exercise both the hip and the knee at the same time by bending that knee when we raise the leg, that doesn't uh, hold that, that nerve straight. It actually allows that nerve to kind of uh, like, just like our, our elbow to kind of sink in. Okay, does that make sense? So for this skill, remember we always lift from below, right? We're going to lift the knee, bend it to the, the chest and back down to the bed. Now, not everybody's gonna be able to get all the way to the chest. So we're only gonna go to the point of pain or resistance, right? So we're gonna go as far as we can, all the way back down to the bed, and we're gonna repeat that three times because that's what our care plan tells us to do. Then we're going to go to the ankle. Now the ankle is pretty easy. We're gonna pretend that they're stepping on the gas pedal. So we wanna bend the foot forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, but we don't want that heel to scrape on the sheets when we do this because scraping on the sheets might actually hurt the skin because remember, skin is thinner and more prone to tearing. So what we wanna do is lift the leg from below, support at the ankle, and then bend the foot forward and back. Remember to the point of pain or resistance, we don't ever want to inflict pain. So along the way, we're going to be asking the patient, how does this feel? Is everything okay? Do you have any pain, anything like that? Good, questions? All right, let's take a look at the test specific information here. So we're gonna lift the extremities from below with a flat palm. We've learned that. We're gonna use two points of support near the joint. You've heard that before. We're gonna move slowly and smoothly. We've heard that before too. We're gonna to return all the way to the start position. Flexion extension is up, down. We're not doing abduction, adduction for this particular patient um, or rotation. So this skill is one of the easiest skills there is. We bend the knee up to the chest three times. We flex the foot three times. We put an open in front of it, uh, closing behind it, and that's the entire skill. If you look at the bottom of the page, it'll tell you that somebody with your level of experience should be able to perform this skill within four minutes. It is a very quick skill. Pay attention to which side you're supposed to be working on, the right or the left, because that's going to be very important. So I need a volunteer, somebody to go lay down in that bed, and I will show you this skill. You can leave your shoes on, it's fine. All right, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, how are you? Great, I need to do some exercises on your right hip, knee and ankle, is that okay? I'm gonna close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies. I'll be right back. I have clean hands. Now remember I have to work on her right hip, knee and ankle. So I've got to make sure I'm on the correct side of the bed. This is her right. So the first thing I'm going to do is bend your knee up to your chest and back down to the bed um, like you're walking upstairs. Okay, I'm gonna do all the work. You just let me know if there's any pain or discomfort. Now to do this, I have to bend a little bit it's less than four minutes of my life. If I wanted to put the bed up to make it more comfortable, I could. It's okay to do that. But if I put the bed up to make it more comfortable, what do I have to do at the end of the skill? And if I don't put it back down, you fail. So for me, that's kind of a, because I know at the end of the skill, I'm gonna be in a rush. You know, I just wanna get this over with and I probably will forget to put the bed down. And that's a huge risk 
So for the test, I probably wouldn't raise the bed because it's such a short skill. Okay, good. Okay, so underneath, I'm gonna support the knee and the heel. We're gonna go up and all the way back down to the bed. Feel okay? One more, up, all the way back down, good. Last one, all the way up and back down. Any pain or discomfort? Okay, I'm gonna lift your foot off the bed just a little bit and we're gonna bend the foot forward and back like you're stepping on a gas pedal. So support at the ankle, we're gonna go flex forward and back, feel that stretch, forward and back, feel okay. One more, forward and back, good. Any pain or discomfort? Are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine before I go? Okay, here's your call light. If you need anything at all, let me go ahead and put it in your hand. Feel free to hit the red button to let me know and I'll be back to help. Uh, my environment's clean. I've washed my hands. I don't need to make any corrections. My skill is done. Thank you. Okay, any questions on the first one, the first skill? Questions? All right, let's move on to catheter care, page 114. So a question I get pretty often is, do I have to say everything you say for the test? I mean, do I have to say all of those words? And the answer is no, you're not graded on a script. You're not graded on following exactly what I say, but you are graded on having a conversation with the patient, on telling them what you're doing. Remember, it's their body. So I need to make them a partner in what I'm doing, not just I'm doing it to you, right? That makes them a victim. If I do something to someone that makes them a victim, I don't want them to be a victim. I want them to be a partner. So the more information you can give the patient about what you're doing, the better off they are and the more cooperative they'll become. But if you notice when I did that skill and I told her what I was going to do, I always put it in terms she was familiar with, like walking upstairs, like stepping on the gas pedal. So if you can learn that, how to put these exercises in, a, give an example that the patient is familiar with, it helps them relax because they'll think, oh yeah, that, that's good. I, I know how to do that. That's okay. That's not going to hurt. Okay, good. Questions? All right. So now we're moving on to catheter care. Do you guys remember peri care that we learned on Wednesday? Everybody remember peri care? Go on. All right, catheter care is peri care with an extra step. So what we did with peri care is we uh, put a pad under them, or you know we changed that pad, but they've got a, a clean pad under them. We cleaned the front right? Middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold. We clean the back and then we change the pad again. That was peri care. So catheter care, we're going to do a lot of those same steps. Not all of them, but a lot of those same steps. We're going to put a pad under them. We're not changing one because there's not one there. We're putting a pad under them. We're going to clean the front, middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold. But we don't have to clean the back side. The reason that we had to clean the backside with peri care is because they were laying on urine. Got to get that urine off the skin, right? So this time they're not laying on urine. They have a catheter that's going to be collecting that urine. So we don't have to wash the backside and we don't have to leave them on a pad at the end. You don't want to use a pad under a patient if we don't need it because that pad is gonna hold in body heat, which is gonna make the patient sweat. And now we have warm, dark, moist, not a good environment. 
So if we don't need a pad under them, we don't want to use one. So we're going to put the pad there just to protect the sheet while we're cleaning and then take it away at the end. Good. Now we are going to add an extra step though. We're going to clean the catheter tubing and we'll use that same leaves method that we used before. So we're going to wipe away from the urethra down the tubing four times. Whatever we wash, we rinse the same way. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Okay, so we're gonna clean the peri area and we're gonna clean the tubing. We're gonna put a pad on the bed to protect it while we're doing that. Take the pad away at the end. That's all this skill is. It's not hard. It's equivalent to peri care. Good, questions? But in order to understand how to do this skill, we have to understand what a catheter is and how it works. So that's what we're gonna get into now. So if you turn in your books to page 112, everything I'm going to tell you is on page 112. Now this should look somewhat familiar to you. We talked about this last week. We have kidneys. Those kidneys filter blood how often? How often do kidneys filter blood? All the time, 24 hours a day, never stops, never sleeps, no lights out. They're always working. They're filtering blood and they're producing drips of urine. Those drips go down tubes called ureters and they collect in the bladder. Remember the bladder is nothing more than a Ziploc bag. There's a valve at the bottom of the bladder that holds it closed so that when the bladder, as the, the drips go in the bladder, they stay there, they don't come out. You guys remember that? Then you go to the bathroom, the valve opens, the urine comes out, it closes again, you're ready to go for another couple hours. You guys remember this? Okay, so when we have a catheter, that system is still functioning. The only thing the catheter is doing is holding that valve open. That's it. That's all the catheter does is holds that valve open. And we're giving the urine, because we're holding the valve open, the urine's just going to fall out. We're giving that urine a place to go. So there's two parts to the system. One is the catheter that's holding the valve open. The other is the bag that gives the urine a place to go. Two pieces to this system. Good? Questions? The problem is catheters are kind of like limp spaghetti. So this is a catheter. Oh, let me get this one. This is a catheter, like limp spaghetti. It's not gonna stay here. I could put this catheter, I could put it straight up there. And if I let go, that's exactly what's going to happen to it. It's going to fall out. Nothing there to hold it in place. So we have to have something to hold that catheter in place once we get it there. So That's exactly what we do. So as the nurse, and nurses put catheters in, nurses take catheters out, CNAs don't normally do that. You can be trained in most states, not all. You can be trained in most states to do that as long as it's a routine task on a stable patient and you don't have to think about anything. You're just trained, you do the steps, that's it. Right, so routine task on stable patients. You can be trained to do this, but the way this works, and it's important that you understand how this works so it, you're not so fearful of catheters, is as a nurse, if this patient needs a catheter, I'm gonna take this catheter and I'm going to insert it through the tube that's already there. You guys come pre-plumbed with tubes, the urethra, already there. So I'm gonna take this catheter and I'm gonna insert it into the urethra until I start to get urine. 
when I start to get urine, I know I'm in the bladder. Now, I know I have to do something to keep it there. So I would take a syringe of sterile water, holding this in place, because if I let go, it's gonna fall out. I'm gonna take a syringe of sterile water and I'm gonna inflate a little bubble at the end of the catheter. And do you see where that bubble sits? Right there at the base of the bladder. So you can't feel this. Remember, this is hollow. You can't feel this. And that keeps it from, go, from sliding out. It's a doorstop, that's all it is. Good, questions? Okay, so if I have this catheter inside the bladder, that means that whatever urine is in the bladder is gonna fall down these two holes into the catheter and out into some sort of a bag. Good, make sense? There probably ought to be a bag attached to this because if there's not, where's the urine gonna go? Yeah, everywhere, everywhere. We made our patient incontinent. So we have a catheter attached to a bag and this is what's in the bladder. See how that sticks up? See how that little tail thing sticks up, right? So because my bladder is staying empty, like all the urine is going down the tube, my bladder is staying empty, it's gonna be small. This tip is going to hit the top of the bladder. Only one thing has ever hit the top of your bladder ever. And that is, what does your bladder fill up with? Yeah, pee. The only thing that's ever hit the top of your bladder is pee. So when this tip hits the top of the bladder, when this tip hits the top of the bladder, what is the bladder gonna think is in there? Yeah. So when a patient has a catheter, often they'll say, I feel like I have to pee. They don't. The urine's going through the tube. Their bladder is empty. There's nothing for them to do. But the reason they feel like they have to pee is because of this. This tip. Make sense? So that's completely normal. Completely normal. And it tends to go away in 10 to 12 hours. So if the patient can get involved in something, a movie, a crossword puzzle book, a book they're reading, take a nap, you know, just kind of distract themselves for 10 to 12 hours, that sensation does tend to diminish or go away. We don't want to tell the patient, oh, just go. Well, they can't just go. That valve is not functioning. So they will say, if you tell them, oh, just go, it's fine. They're going to spend the next hour trying to go. <laughs> but that valve isn't responding. So that gets very frustrating. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. So that is very normal. What's not normal is pain. Okay, so catheter in place, I have to pee, normal. Catheter in place, ow, it hurts, not normal. Anybody ever have a Charlie horse in your leg? How bad do they hurt? Yeah, like on a scale of one to 10, 43, right? They hurt. Well, there are some people, very, very, very small percentage of the population, like less than 2%. But there are some people that when we put this catheter in the bladder, the bladder says, hey, dude, you don't belong. And it spasms to try to push the thing out. Now, bladder spasms are a Charlie horse of the bladder, okay? So instead of be having that pain in your leg where you can kind of stand and stretch it out and grit your teeth and wait for it to pass, this is in the middle of your body. You can't do anything about it. So it is just pain. So if your patient says, ow, it hurts, don't tell them, oh yeah, that's normal. It'll go away soon. It hurts is always notify the nurse right away. Now, not later. Okay, good. 
good. We do have a medication we can give patients. If their bladder is spasming, we have a medication we can give them. And it puts the bladder to sleep. It's a great, great thing. But medications have side effects, don't they? One of the side effects of this particular medication is that in some people, the bladder will never wake back up, ever, ever, ever. So we have to be very careful and identify our patients using assessments to figure out whether that medication is reasonable for them. Good. This is why, guys, when we take a catheter out, one of the biggest tasks the CNA is going to have is to make sure the patient can pee. So if as a nurse, I remove a catheter, I'm gonna tell you, let me know when the patient's able to pee. And you wanna see it, you know, like evidence. Because your patients will lie to you, they wanna go home. They will lie to you. So you wanna actually see it, okay? Show me your pee. Good, questions here? You guys understand how catheters work? Now, catheters should not cause pain, but there may be some discomfort. Now, discomfort's different than pain, but let me explain to you why. Remember that we're holding that valve open? You guys remember that, right? So if we're holding that valve open, that means urine can come out all by itself. It doesn't need anything because the valve is being held open. So if our catheter is not a snug fit in this tube, see how this has a gap on each side? That gap is gonna let urine come out around the catheter. We're gonna have leaking. And now we've got urine against skin and, and we're gonna have to clean them every two hours and it's a mess, right? So we don't want that. We don't want a gap. We wanna make sure that this fits snug in the urethra. So we have different sizes of catheters to make sure, yep, different sizes of catheters to make sure that what we're doing is a snug fit. So that's going to feel a little uncomfortable for the patient. Not painful. Remember, the tube is already there, right? Your urethra is already, we're not drilling, right? The, the, the urethra is already there. But if our catheter isn't a snug fit, and snug means it's gonna be uncomfortable. We're not used to having something there. So if our patient is confused, they're probably gonna tug it out because it's uncomfortable. Does that make sense? It's good. Now, we don't use catheters unless we absolutely positively have to use a catheter. If this urine has any other way of getting out of the body, We'll take it. We don't want to use catheters just for convenience. So if I have an incontinent patient, well, that urine's coming out by itself. I don't need to be involved in that. So I don't need to worry about having a catheter. We don't use them for convenience. But sometimes we have to use them if the patient has a wound. So if they've got a big bed sore on their backside, I don't want that urine to get into that wound and eat the wound. I don't uh, want you to pee on my serial field during a surgery. So a catheter would be indicated. If we are giving you an epidural because you're having a baby and you can't feel anything below your mid chest area, you can't walk to the bathroom. So we've got to give you a catheter to help take care of that. So does that kind of make sense, right? So we only use catheters if there's a reason to, not convenience. We have to have a reason to, and this is why. Do you remember we talked last week about bladders being the ideal breeding environment? Every, every pathogen in the world is trying to find a bladder to get into. And remember, we got a couple white blood cells hanging out in the urethra that act as bouncers. And if a, a pathogen comes in, it kind of knocks it away and kills it. And we end up not getting a UTI. Well, the problem is when we put a catheter in there, we are putting a barrier between that white blood cell and the, the bad guys. 
So that means that bad guys, pathogens in this system can are free to multiply and climb, multiply and climb, multiply and climb, multiply and climb, so that by the time they jump out of these holes into the bladder, it's an overwhelming infection. Okay, I'm gonna see that in just a minute. So remember that when we put a catheter in place, the bladder is not holding urine. It's going right out the catheter, which holds the valve open and into a storage device like a bag. And we have a couple of different bags that we can use for different purposes. And I'll go over that in a minute. But remember the whole point is to hold that valve open and keep the bladder uh, decompressed. That's okay, so when you put a catheter, they normally, most likely, whenever I've had a catheter, they've always gave me antibiotic because they said it would make it make them urine infections. Right. So that's the reason. Yep, and I'm going to show you that right now, right here. So when we have catheter, or when we have a catheter in place, and we have pathogens that get in there, those pathogens don't have anything to stop them from procreate. Now inside that urine is everything they need. There's enzymes and proteins and all the things they need to procreate. So they take in those enzymes and proteins, they zip themselves in half, and, and now we got two. Those two become four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, five, you know, and so on. So this can quickly get out of hand. So if we don't do something to arrest this, when the bacteria emerge into the bladder, which is like nirvana, it's not one or two bacteria, it's one or two trillion, which is an overwhelming infection. Your patient will go from just fine to really, really sick like that. Yeah, in like less than a half an hour because there, there's, there was nothing to affect this growth of bacteria. And there's only two exits from this area, just two. There's the tube they came out of. Well, they're not going backwards. So the only other exits they have are your ureters and those lead to the kidneys and the kidneys filter blood. Not necessarily. It really depends on the doctor, the patient's risk factors. There's a lot of things they have to take into consideration. Um, it depends on the patient's history as well how susceptible they are to urinary tract inf infections. So it's not an automatic, but it is often used, okay? So does this risk of infection make sense? So our whole goal here is to not even let one bacteria into the system, not even one, because one becomes two two becomes four. So we don't want any bacteria into the system. And that's where infection control comes in with these next two skills. So catheter care and emptying that drainage bag kind of go together, but they are two separate skills. Good? Make sense? All right. So when we have a catheter, Remember the catheter holds the tubing, or I'm sorry, the valve open. The bag collects the urine, two separate pieces, and they connect right here. They connect right there. CNAs generally do not separate these two pieces. Now you can be trained to do so, but you have to be trained. Generally speaking, for the test, we do not separate these two pieces. Because remember, we don't even want one bacteria in the system. And by separating these two, we're allowing a bacteria to potentially get into the system. But they have to be two pieces because the catheter that holds the valve open can stay in for up to 30 days. The bag that holds the urine 
should be changed out every week. So if we have one piece that can stay in 30 days and one piece that can only stay in a week, they have to be two separate pieces. You can be trained to change the bags out. And to do that, you just unhook them, get a new bag, and you're gonna hook it back in. But when we do this, we wanna make sure that we aren't touching anything. It's gotta, gotta remain pretty sterile, okay? You'll go by your facility policy on that. And the reason is, yes, we used to use alcohol wipes on all parts of this, but alcohol is a drying agent. So it tends to cause little micro cracks in this plastic because it dries out. So you have to go by your facility policy. Right, right. It's not a one size fits all. So, well, we're not gonna clean this with soap and water. We're gonna clean this. And we're gonna get there in just a minute, okay? But I need you to understand these are two separate pieces. CNAs do not take these apart unless you've been trained to do so. So nurses put the catheter in, CNAs clean the catheter and empty the bag. But when we empty the bag, this is where we can allow bacteria in. So we have to be really, really careful about what we do when we empty the bag because we don't want to let bacteria in. So this port is how we empty the bag. And it has a little house here that it lives in. When we remove the port from its house, we don't want that port to touch anything, not our fingers or gloves, not the container we're emptying it into, not the bed, not the chucks, nothing. It can't touch anything. And when we put it back into its house, we want to do it in a way that it doesn't touch much of the bag just the little house part, good? So we're gonna remove this. We're gonna slide it to the side to open it. This is a T-valve. So we slide it to the side to open it. We're gonna empty it into a container, close it, and then very carefully put it back into its home. Good. We do not separate these two pieces. So I'm gonna pass this around. You can take a look at the different parts of a catheter. I find that it's helpful for you guys to see it and feel it and know how it works to take some of the fear away. So as CNAs, well, remember there, there's two parts to the system. There's the catheter that holds the valve open and then there's a drainage bag that collects the urine. And there's three points of entry. There's the tip of the catheter that's inside the patient. There's where the catheter and tubing meet. And then there's the drainage port on the bag. This is where bacteria can enter the system. So when we're cleaning catheters, our job is to try to keep it as clean as possible. So the catheter itself, where it exits the body, we're gonna clean that once a shift with soap and water. But remember, let's go back one. Remember that this is inside the body. So if we put a washcloth here and pull, it's gonna pull inside the body. So we don't wanna do that. We wanna hold the catheter in place while we're cleaning away from the body. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry, okay? So a couple things to know about catheters. The bag has to be below the hips at all times. Well, that just makes sense. Anybody here want recycled urine? That's pretty gross, isn't it? When you lift a bag up above the patient's hips, all that urine's gonna run right back up into the patient, along with any bacteria that might be in the system. So we have to be super careful not to let that catheter bag go above the level of the patient's hips. And I see this in clinical settings. People will walk a patient down the hall and they'll have the bag held. And it, oh, recycled urine. That's really high on my gross meter. Don't do that. But we also don't want that bag on the floor. 
Because remember, pathogens are on the floor. So no contact with the floor. So that means it needs to be hanging on a part of the bed that doesn't move, right? Not above the hips, not on the floor, hanging from a part of the bed that doesn't move. Well, that would be important because if you move the bed and the catheter bag moves, we could pull it out. So um, we're going to talk about pulling out catheters in a minute. Anytime that we move a patient, we want to look to see, do they have a catheter always before you move them? And if our patient is tugging on the catheter, we need to report that to the nurse. The chances are they're probably going to dislodge it. Now, that's a bad day. Right. When your patients pull out catheters, it's a bad day. You've got a bulb this big coming through an opening this big. You're going to have tissue tearing. You're going to get a little urine, maybe a little blood. It's okay. Your patient's not going to die. Don't freak out. If you go in there and freak out, oh my God, what did you do? Your patient is going to freak out. So remain calm. But the big thing is that you have to save this and the bag. You got to save the whole thing. So you're going to get a empty trash bag, put that whole system, let's do that real quick, that whole system in the empty trash bag, and you're going to go get the, and put it in the bathroom, just leave it in the bathroom, and you're going to go get the nurse and tell the nurse, hey, so-and-so pulled out his catheter, the whole thing is in the bathroom for you to look at. There's a big reason for that. Remember that this balloon is what's holding the catheter in place, right? If the catheter comes out and that balloon is not intact, that means part of the balloon was left behind in the patient. That's a big deal. So this I can deal with. A catheter that has burst requires a doctor. So I'm going to pass these two catheters around so you can see the difference between an intact balloon and one that has burst and left a piece behind in the patient. While you're looking at these two catheters, I also want you to pay attention to the size difference and the color difference uh, down here. This is how we know what size the catheter is. So you were asking about different sizes before. This gives you two um, examples of different sizes. So if, say, the Google pulls the catheter out, do you take, like, do you take something to get the bubble out? Okay, remember that CNAs don't take catheters out without training. No, yes. So you would be trained on that, but that's exactly how it works, it is just like um, we put, the water in using a syringe to inflate the bubble. We have to use a syringe to take the water out of the bubble to get it. And remember, if without the bubble, the catheter just falls out, and that's what's going to happen here. Okay, good. Catheter removal should not hurt the patient. Right, because oh my gosh, I'm back to normal. Right. But if a patient's tugging on their catheter, we need to let the nurse know. Um, we're gonna try to find another alternative. I, I need to evaluate, do we really absolutely need this catheter in place? If the patient's tugging on it, they're probably gonna pull it out. Um, and patients do pull them out quite often actually. But as bad as that is, CNAs pull out way more catheters than patients do. Way more catheters than patients do. And that's because CNAs don't always pay attention to safety. So remember that we never want to raise the bag above the level of the patient's hips. And we don't want the tubing, well, we don't want the bag to touch the floor, but we don't want the tubing to be coiled near the floor either. Because if the tubing is coiled, our feet can get all caught up in that tubing and accidentally pull the catheter out as we're walking. The other issue with um, pulling patients out is when we transfer them or turn them in bed. We tend to pull out way more catheters than patients do. So as CNAs, we have to be super aware 
of which of our patients have catheters and which don't. So catheters should always be on a non-moving part of the bed and there should be enough slack in the tubing that the patient can roll and turn without pulling the catheter out. Thank you. And remember the tubing should never be coiled on the floor. So these are ways that CNAs pull catheters out. When we turn a patient over in bed, when we transfer a patient to, to a chair or wheelchair, when we walk a patient, if our feet get tangled in tubing that's near the floor, uh, confuse patients, and patients sometimes will intentionally pull them out because they just don't want them there. But this is probably the, my most common. Patients that are walking, um, remember if you're upright, gravity is gonna assist in this, right? And it's really easy if you are not walking right beside the patient and slightly behind, if you get ahead of the patient or too far behind, that catheter will pull out. So remember with ambulate with a gate belt, I told you the most important step was to watch the patient. This is one of the reasons. And man, that hurts. Can you imagine peeing through that? It hurts. It hurts. So if a catheter comes out and you have to document, now remember you will, your documentation will um, completely depend on where you work. Some places do not let CNAs document in words. Other places do. But if you do get to document in words, it needs to be facts only. And you wanna try to reduce your, your use of the word I. You don't wanna say, I found the catheter on the floor. Or I noticed this. We wanna to try to get you out of it. You have no bearing in this. So. You would wanna say something like catheter found laying in bed or laying on the floor. That's how I found the catheter. You wanna indicate if the balloon was intact or not. And you always wanna indicate that you notified the nurse. So what did you do about that? Okay. Now there is a different type of catheter. This is only put in if we need to leave it in. And remember the catheter can stay in up to 30 days. But if I just need a urine sample, or I need to um, reduce the volume in the urine or in the bladder, I probably wouldn't use one of these because I don't need to leave it in. I would use something like this. It is a catheter without the bubble. This is called a Red Robinson. It's red. Guy who invented it's name was Robinson. They call it a Red Robinson. It's also called a straight path. This is an indwelling catheter, which means we're gonna put it in and it's meant to stay there, but it's also called a Foley catheter. You'll hear it called Foley way more than indwelling. So the big difference between the two is that this one has a bubble, this one does not. This one has a port to fill the bubble, this one does not. So a couple different types of catheters, but wait, there's more. We also have another type of catheter. So if you go to page 116, halfway down the first column, you will see what we call an external catheter. Also called a, a uh, Texas catheter or a condom catheter. So a Texas catheter or a condom catheter. These are used in male patients. They literally go, go on, they're adhesive. They go on the shaft of the penis and they're designed to direct urine out through that little tip into a drainage bag. The problem is that this does, the, the patient does have to go right on their own. So, th so there is some effort required for the patient. Um, but it also allows contact of the urine against the skin. So these have to be um, removed and the skin has to be clean at least every three days. And when I say cleaned, I mean thoroughly cleaned. 
because that urine right up next to the skin is going to eventually have an effect. Now, if you look at the top page 116, you'll see a leg bag. Remember I said there's a couple of different types of bags. We have the bedside bag, which is the larger one. That's the one that you see here. That's the one you'll be testing on for the test. Uh, the larger ones, the bedside bags, hold more urine. We generally empty them out once a shift. And we're going to write down, because anybody that has a catheter is on intake and output. So we're going to write down how much we measure. That's a big part of emptying the bag is measuring the urine and writing it down. But sometimes if our patient is not in bed, if they're out in the community, they don't want to carry a suitcase of urine around. That's just, you know embarrassing. So they would want something a little more discreet. This leg bag that you see at the top of the first column on page 116, that leg bag is designed to be worn under clothing discreetly. And patients usually are able to, to uh, empty this on their own. But they work very similar. Instead of a T-valve, it's just a twist valve to empty it. All right, so our care plan here on page 114, tells us to provide catheter care with soap and water to a female resident with an indwelling urinary catheter. Clean the catheter tubing and perineal area only. That's all we're doing here. We're going to use those washing rules. We're, of course, going to do our opening, use a barrier for our supplies. We definitely need gloves because we're in personal space and we're working with body fluids. Our patient's uncovered and undress, so we need a privacy blanket. We're not gonna hold the linens up next to our uniform. Um, we're gonna put the chucks under the patient using clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. We're gonna use our washing rules. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. We check the water and they check the water. We're gonna clean our basin the same way we clean everything else and we're gonna do our closing. So you already know the steps here. We're gonna use those leaves method when we clean because we're working with a wet body opening. So we wanna make sure that we're holding the catheter where it exits the body and we're wiping the tubing away from the urethra. So we never wanna go back up. This is always one way, away from the urethra. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. We're gonna do peri care the same way we did peri care. Down the middle, side, side, skin fold, skin fold. And that's catheter care. That's all we do. So we clean the tubing and you clean the peri area. It doesn't matter what you do first. Nobody cares. As long as it gets done. All right, so here are our testing checkpoints. We're gonna protect the, the sheet with the chucks. We're gonna use leaves method with a new leaf for each stroke. We're always gonna clean from front to back. We'll clean down the middle on the outer labia and then the skin folds. We're going to clean, we never go back up. We're going to clean the catheter away from the body, holding it where it exits the body. And at the end, we're gonna remove the chucks. Good, pretty easy, right? Okay. So I'm going to talk to you now about drainage bag. I'm gonna show you these two videos back to back. Um, one right after the other. So I wanna talk about drainage bag before I show you the video. So everything you need to know, everything I'm gonna tell you is on page 115 and 16. We just went over most of it. And the care plan is on one, page 117. But our care plan tells us to empty the resident's urinary drainage bag into a graduate container. So that's what this is. It's called a graduate container because it has measuring markings on it. That's the graduated part. And you'll see that on the container, there's ounces and then there's cc's. In healthcare, which side do we use? Ounces or cc's? CC. CC's. So we're gonna ignore this side. When you empty the drainage bag, it's gotta be totally empty, guys. Don't leave urine in that drainage bag. It needs to be empty. But when you empty the bag into the container, when we measure it, it has to be on a barrier on a flat surface and we have to be at eye level to measure. And we're gonna look to see where does the urine uh, end. 
And whatever line it's closest to is what we're going to document as the reading. So it doesn't matter whether you're rounding up or down, it's whatever line it's closest to. But if you're looking at this, you'll see a line here for 350, a small line, and then a line for 400. That small line halfway between 350 and 400 would be 375. So remember how to read this, okay? And you're gonna round to the nearest line, nearest line. But this has to be read on a barrier, on a flat surface at eye level. All three of those things have to be met for you to get credit for it. If you do this and it's not on a barrier, you don't get credit for anything on that line. There's no partial credit. These bags, this is the same bag as what I just showed you. It's the same bag that we use for training. It's the same bag you'll be using for testing. It has markings on it. We do not use these markings. You have to empty it out into a container and measure it. Okay. We don't carry an open container of urine through a room. We already know that. We learned that with bedpan. So we're gonna put a chucks on the floor. We're gonna put the container on the chucks. We're gonna empty the urine into the container. We're gonna take that chucks, wrap it around the container to take it to the bathroom. And that's where we're gonna do our measuring. So this is what your uh, container should look like during transport. And when you get to the, the toilet, we're gonna set it down on the lid of the toilet on a barrier on a flat surface, and we're going to get down and read it at eye level. The evaluators will also read it to see how accurate you are. Now, when you're done with this skill, you're going to have to document. We measured something, so we have to document. Don't forget to document. They'll give you the documentation form before you ever start this skill. Put it in a place that you can see it easily. But we're going to document it on the intake and output form. Is your an intake or output? Oh, I hope so. So we want to put the time. Military time is best, but you can use regular time. If you do, you have to use AM or PM. We're going to put the type of output, which is yeah. urine. You have to put the type. Not everything that comes out of the body is urine. Okay. How much we measured and our initials. So this is the documentation form that we will be using for the test. Make sure you put it in output. That's the number one error for this skill. All right, so here's our testing uh, checkpoints. We're gonna protect the floor, keep the bag lower than the hips. If you wanna inspect the tubing, make sure it's not near the floor, it's not kinked, it it's, uh, gives the patient room to move about in the bed. When we're measuring or when we're emptying, we don't want the port to touch anything. We'll make sure we close the valve and return it to storage. We'll wrap the chucks around it to carry. We're going to measure it on a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level. And then we're going to document. Questions? Okay, I'm going to show you these last two videos. And then the rest of the class will be practiced for you. We are now done with the skills. Good job, guys.
Jim Tominus, Patty on the TNA today, and how are you? Good, I'm just a cat of affairs, is that okay? I'm going to close the curtains, walk my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, Miss Jones, I'm going to gather my supplies. I'll start out with a barrier that provides a clean place to put my supplies. And we're going to get four washcloths, a towel, a chucks, a privacy blanket, and now I'll gather my basin and soap. And a set of gloves. All right, Miss Jones, I'll just get some water. I'll be right back. Would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? It's good? Good. I'll place the washcloth in there to stay warm. I'm going to cover you with a privacy blanket. This is going to help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this still. I'm going to pull your sheet down to about your knees. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to place this pad underneath you. This is going to help keep your bed dry while we do this skill. First, I'll roll it toward me. Place it on the bed. And then I'll put my gloves on. All right, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll onto your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. You're going to be very careful, making sure that the catheter tubing rolls with the patient and doesn't get pulled on. I'm going to unroll the cuffs underneath the patient's hip and have the patient come back onto their back, making sure that they don't lay on that catheter tubing. Ms. Jones, can you scoot to the middle of the bed, please? Thank you. Ms. Jones, can you scoot for me? Thank you. And roll up onto your right side. One, two, three. And now we're going to unroll the chucks to protect the bed. Come on back, Ms. Jones. And scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to start cleaning the catheter. I'm going to roll your gown up inside the blanket. I will be exposing you, but we'll make this as brief as possible. Please let me know if you're uncomfortable. As I roll the gown in the blanket, I want to make sure that I don't grab the catheter, that we don't cause any unnecessary pulling or stress on that catheter. And now we'll cover our thighs with a towel. This exposes only the area that we're working on. I'm going to take the first cloth cloth and wring it out and apply soap to four leaves. One, two, three, four. Now I'm going to clean your catheter. I'm going to hold the catheter where it exits the body. Wrap the washcloth around and wipe away from the body. Fold that leaf over. I'm going to hold it, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. That's two. We're going to do this two more times. Away from the body. Three. And the last one. Four. I'll set this washcloth aside. Whenever we wash, we must rinse. So I'll wring this washcloth out, and we'll use it to rinse that catheter the same way we wash. I'm going to hold it where it exits the body, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. We'll do this four times. Two, three, 
and four. Set this aside. Now we're drawing the pattern. Now we're going to do fairy tail. We'll take a washcloth out of the basin, bring it out really well. And we're going to sew five corners. One, two, three, four, and the back side is five. Okay, now I'm going to clean the fairy area. I'm going to lift the catheter up out of the way with my pinky and hold the labia open while I clean down the center with the first leaf. Always going top to bottom, and then we'll remove the washcloth and fold that leaf over. Now I'm going to clean down one side of the labia, top to bottom, pull that leaf over, clean down the other side of the labia, top to bottom, pull that leaf over. I'm going to clean the skin fold between the groin and the leg, pull that leaf over, and clean the other skin fold between the groin and the leg, and then set that washcloth aside. I'm going to take the final washcloth and wring it out really well. And we're going to rinse all of those areas the same way that we wash them. So I'll fold that catheter out of the way and spread the labia open, cleaning down the center, top to bottom. Fold that leaf over, clean down one side of the labia, fold that leaf over, rinse down the other side of the labia, fold that leaf over. We're going to rinse the skin fold, fold that leaf over, and the other skin fold. So we have a tie. Now we'll dry gently by patting dry top to bottom and then removing the towel. The are going to cover you back up. I'll unroll that blanket, which will replace the gown over the patient. I'm going to make sure that the catheter and the tubing is coiled on the bed, not near the floor and not where the patient is laying on it, making sure it's not pain. Ms. Jones, I'll be right back. I need to dispose of her supplies. The towels and washcloth will be placed in dirty linen. The basin is going to be clean the way we clean everything else. We'll return the basin to the drawer and on the way we'll pick up the soap. We'll open the drawer with the paper towel, return the basin from the storage area. Now I'll dispose of my paper towels. Okay, Ms. Jones, I need to remove the cups from under you. Can I get you to skip toward me, please? Thank you. And can I get you to roll up on your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. I'll roll this royal chest toward the patient and tuck it under her hip. Come on back, Ms. Jones. And scoot back to the middle, making sure the patient is not laying on that catheter tubing. Okay, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me again, please? Thank you. And roll up on your right side. And I'm going to remove that chest from the back. Okay, you can scoot back to the middle. Thank you. This is going to be thrown away. Okay, Ms. Jones, let me just look at your catheter one last time. Make sure that the catheter tubing is coiled on the bed, that the catheter is not on the floor. Everything looks good. I'm going to remove the cups from the table, and we're going to throw this away, and then I'll remove my gloves. I'll go this way. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'll pull your sheet up now. And I'll remove the blanket as I do so, rolling it into a ball. You put this in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, here's the call light. If you need anything, just let me know. Are you comfortable? Can I get you anything while I'm here, like magazine? I'm just going to open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections that need to be made, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. <laughs> Anybody have any questions on that? <laughs> <laughs> 
on tab work there? It is done on a mannequin. So that <laughs> a little less functional. <laughs> All right, so here's the last skill. This is emptying and measuring the contents of the urinary drainage bag. This takes about five minutes. Hello, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Great. I need to empty your urinary drainage bag. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I just feel I'll need a barrier, which I'll place on the floor under the drainage bag. I'm going to need a set of gloves. I'm going to need a triangular graduate container. I want to inspect the catheter tubing to make sure that it's coiled on the bed and the patient isn't lying on it and it's not pink, but also that it's not hanging near the floor where somebody might get their feet tangled up and it's in trip or accidentally let the catheter out. This catheter looks like it's in the appropriate position. We'll now remove the port from its protective sleeve on the back. Driving it out to the side will open the port. You can now position this open port over the graduated container and tilt the bag slightly to the side to allow the contents to drain into the graduated container. While doing so, we want to be careful not to allow that port to touch any other surface. Once the urine bag has been emptied, we'll slide the port back to the side to close it and very carefully insert it back into its protective sleeve. <laughs> we want to make sure that the bag is hanging on a non-movable part of the bed and it's not touching the floor. We can now fold the cups over the graduate container for safe and secure transport to the patient's bathroom. Once we're at the patient's bathroom, we're going to set the graduate container down on a barrier on a flat surface and position it so that we can read it. We need to be at our level, and we're going to round to the nearest line, either up or down. You can see that the urine in this container is nearest to the bottom of 425, so the amount that we'll document is 425 milliliters, or cc's. Once we've measured it on a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level, we can now empty the urinary graduate container. We'll throw the barrier away, Open up the toilet, and we're going to dump the contents of the graduate container into the toilet. Now we're going to rinse the graduate container. We'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. Now we can clean. After dumping the rinse water into the toilet, we'll set it down, use a paper towel to pick it up, Paper towel to dry the outside. Paper towel to dry the inside. We'll discard this and then wipe with the drawer. We're going to place the graduate container in the bottom drawer and close the drawer with the paper towel. Okay, now I'll throw the paper towels away and remove my gloves. those way as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine, perhaps? If you have your call out there, if you should need anything at all, please feel free to let me know. I'm going to open your curtain, wash my hands, and document my skill. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll document it on the intake and output sheet that the evaluator gives me. I'm going to document the time of output, 
the type of output with the theorem, the amount of output in CCs, and my init codes. After documenting all the data sets in my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. And remember that we have to um, wash our hands after documentation. Don't forget that. Any questions on what we've learned so far? Any questions on any of it? No? Okay, I want to take just a minute and because I'm getting ready to open this up for practice for you. I want to show you a way that you can um, kind of review the skills really quickly. Uh, you've seen this, but I just redid it. So it's a little bit different now. So here, these are the checklists for each one of the skills. And I had across the top all of the, the different um, principles. And remember, you can find each one of them here in the packet. But what I went through and did, and this is why this packet's a little bit different, is I actually highlighted each one <laughs> based on the principle that that checklist adheres to. So when you're looking at this, you can see that 1, 2, 9, 10, and 12 are all covered by the open. Um, half of 10, 11, 12, and 13 are covered by the closing. You can see anything without, anything here, that's going to be covered with the actual skill updates. So you can use this to get familiar with the checklists and what you're going to be graded on, but also correspond them to the actual uh, principles that we've learned. So one of the things that I would suggest you do is grab one of these, go through and get, you know, get the uh, the banners for each thing that's on the top. So this one you would get one, two, three, four, five banners. Lay them out on the table and read each one of those steps so that you would know how to effectively do this particular skill. So it's a way of practicing without physically being at a bed. So if, if somebody is practicing on the bed and you don't have anything to do, this is a great way to read it. Okay. But the, what makes this a little bit different is that um, they're now color coded based on the actual steps. Okay. So that's available for you as well. And uh, the flashcards came in, the new flashcards. So I'm going to go get, a, I haven't looked at them yet. <laughs> so I'm going to go get a set of those. And while you guys are practicing, I'll take a look at the flashcards. You guys can see the new ones as well. Um, remember, they're on sale for $14.99 until Wednesday or through Wednesday. All right. Good morning to everybody that joined us. Uh, I don't see any questions. In YouTube world. So I don't see any YouTube questions. So we're going to go ahead and sign off in just a moment. I'm going to give everybody your review sheet for today. Those of you who are joining us, I'll turn my microphone on. Those of you who are joining us from YouTube World, you can always access these in our course. So courses.foryourcna.com. Under the first lesson, you'll see the review sheet for today. You can print it off and play along. All right, let me go ahead and give you guys your review sheet. And then the rest of the class will be practice. Remember, if you kept up with the review sheets um, after class is over, it's a really handy way to be able to review everything that we've gone over in the class. So it, it creates kind of like a study book. For the team. Okay, YouTube world, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, make sure you join us on Wednesday for graduation. We've got a lot of important information we're covering on Wednesday. You don't want to miss it. And Thursday is our live. I hope to see you there. So Thursday at 3 p.m. for our live session. Uh, until next time, happy caregiving. Bye.